Travel all over the countryside, Oscar Leyland, Oscar Leyland. Travel all over the countryside, Oscar Leyland, brother. Whatever it is that you want to see, Oscar Leyland, Oscar Leyland. No matter whatever that happens to be, Oscar Leyland, brother. Come on, me in and then join in the fun. Travel all over Australia. This week we're going to show you one of Australia's most common birds, the emu. But the bird itself is most unusual. It's a pet emu, and it's on a sheep station called Langawira out here in western New South Wales. It's almost part of the family out there. Then we're going to Queensland to a very unusual beach here at Tiwa where all the sands are naturally coloured. And they're so colourful in fact that an artist uses them to do beautiful paintings with. Then we're going across to Western Australia up into the Hammersley Ranges to show iron ore mining at Mount Tom Price. During the making of this series so far, we've had a number of requests from people wanting to see emus. Most of these requests have come from children. Probably the most unusual one came from Mrs. Robin McLeod, a school teacher with the School of the Air at Broken Hill. She said that on the property of Langawira, which is part of her school area, the Gall family have made a pet of an emu. The emu apparently comes into the homestead. Anyhow, we're going to have a look at the family and the way they treat the emu, and we're going to meet John and Lynn Gall, and of course, Beep the emu. Beep is a real family pet. Although he has the freedom of the entire sheep station, he always seems to prefer the yard at the homestead and frequently plays rather boisterous games with the Gaul children, Lockie and Catherine. How did you get an emu to be so friendly? Did it start off as a, a wild one and you caught it or what? No, no, we found it as a, an egg in the, in the nest and we brought it home and... Uh, Put it on the stove and it hatched out. You, uh, you actually hatched the egg on the stove? Yes, yes. It, uh, my wife heard it whistling on the stove, and uh, or the egg whistling, and I gave it a crack with a, a hammer to break the shell, and, and we peeled the, um, the membrane off him, and uh, out he came. And for about a day and a half he was just finding his legs, and uh, after that he was able to fend for himself. How old is he now? He's about one year old now. Well, before you were showing me something with this board here, is this, you said that if you tap that, that's like, a bit like what they uh, do in the wild, isn't it? Oh, yes, the, the old bird, when it teaches the chickens to peck, um, it goes around pecking the things on the, uh, on the ground and the, and the chickens look where the old one's pecking and, and they eat the, what sort of she's pecking at. Um, so they can feed for themselves almost straight away, can they? Can they? Well, after about uh, two days, when they can walk, well, there's no artificial feeding by the sort of the parent bird at all. They look after themselves, yes. And uh, how close... Oh, you can't have that. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> and just how close to the family that does be become, really? Oh, he's very friendly. I um, feed him with the cats every morning. <laughs> It's possible that Beep thinks he's a cat. He shares the milk bowl with 15 of them every morning. Lynn Gall cared for Beep when he was tiny and allowed him the freedom of the kitchen. As a result, he still thinks the house is a normal place for an emu to live. Beep 
sheep's appetite seems insatiable, and immediately after the session with the cats, he's often allowed to join the family for breakfast. Beep does leave the homestead occasionally and runs with wild emus, but always finds his way home. He seems to prefer human companionship and will always follow John when he goes down to the nearby lake for boating. In the summer, the emu takes a fully-fledged swim, but in the cooler winter mornings prefers to simply wade in the shallows. In the wild, he will be approaching the breeding age soon and tend to the eggs after his mate has laid them. But for the moment, Beep seems quite content to live his life of luxury on the property. John Gall's father once had a pet emu years ago, and it lived to a ripe old age and never ran off to join its wild cousins in the bush. It's beginning to look as though Beep will be wandering the shores of the beautiful lake for a long time, observing the passing parade of nature's wildlife, but never really being part of it. Cunningham of Glen Innes in New South Wales asks if we could show the coloured sands of Tiwa in Queensland. He also goes on to say, how are the coloured sands formed? What are they used for today? To find the answers to your questions, John, we've come here to the Sunshine Coast. We're going to accompany Bert Rosima in his four-wheel drive bus and drive 20 miles up the beach to look at the famous coloured sands. Arriving on the beach early in the morning gives us plenty of time to drive the 30 kilometres and see the coloured sand in the best light. Bert and Helen Rosima are happy to show us their favourite area of the coloured sand. Regardless of how many people they take to see the sands, they never tire of the beautiful drive along the beach. Bert and Helen find the sands constantly changing and just as fascinating each visit. These coloured sands occur over 30 kilometres of Queensland's coast from Tawantan to Double Island Point. In some spots they reach heights of 200 metres. The area is now a national park and taking sand or damaging formations is prohibited. The variety of colours and tones seems to be endless from delicate pastels to strong rich reds and oranges with every shade between. Everywhere one looks are intriguing natural sculptures. Bert, could we tell John Cunningham how the colours got here in the sand? Yeah, Mike, there's two basic things here that uh, sort of forms the colour. Firstly is decaying vegetation, and secondly is all the iron through the range. Now, originally they say that there was a tremendous amount of iron in this range here, but gradually over a period of time it's rusted away, and the decaying vegetation sets up a sort of a dye in it, and then the rusting of the iron also adds its colouring to the sand itself. And you can see this vein of iron running through here. Well, with the salt air, that iron, layer by layer, it'll rust back to a dust. And of course, in the process, it stains the sand. Well, John, to answer your question about is the coloured sand used for anything today, we found an artist, Bern Kemp, who uses the coloured sands to make sand paintings. Now, yeah, Bern, where did you get the sand? Well, actually, they came from the coloured sands before it became a national park. Uh, and, and you do get sand from elsewhere as well? Oh, yes, from right along the coastline. And all the colours in the sands here, are they natural? Yes, Mike, they're natural. There's no, no, no artificial colours or pigments. Before he can use the sand, Bern sorts it into different tonings. He has counted 70 different colours. Bern's technique of preparing the sand for painting is a result of years of experimentation and is a closely guarded secret. Once prepared, the sand is applied with palette knives and brushes. All Burns' works are sand alone. He uses no artificial colouring. Many of Burns' paintings reflect his interest in local history. One of his favourites is the Aboriginal legend of the coloured sands. The beautiful maiden Marawa was in love with the rainbow. 
One day she escaped from Burwell, the man who had enslaved her. As she ran along the beach, he sent his terrible boomerang to kill her. The faithful Rainbow sped to rescue Marawa. The boomerang and Rainbow met in the sky with a terrible roar. The boomerang died instantly, and the poor shattered Rainbow lay on the beach to die. It is still there, with all its colours forming the hills along the beach. Or as legend would have us believe. History, on the other hand, is in no risk of contradiction about the shipwreck of the Cherry Venture. It is held firmly by the beach of coloured sands. These unique paintings have found their way into private collections all over the world. Is it the subtle natural colours that add so much to Burns' paintings? Or is it Burns' artistic talent that shows the coloured sands to such advantage? Whichever it is, these coloured sand paintings are truly beautiful works of art. As beautiful as nature's breathtaking display on the beach at Tiwa in Queensland. I'm not looking at the incredible shrinking man, I'm just standing beside one of the giants of the west. 1,000 horsepower, 84 tonne web car iron ore truck. One tyre alone costs $3,000 and they carry 120 tonnes of iron ore from one of the biggest open cut mines in the world. Everything over here in the west is big and the reason we're here today is that Mr A. Macdonald from Parramatta in New South Wales wrote and said, I like many people have a dabble on the stock market and hear names like Hammersley Iron Mount Tom Price and the like, but I've no idea what these places look like. Could I ask the Leyland brothers to go to the Hammersley area and show me these iron ore mines and the towns that have been built because of them? Well, Mr MacDonald, we're going to show you the whole operation of the Mount Tom Price mine. Iron ore has brought life to the northwest. Lang Hancock, grazier and prospector, was a discoverer of the huge iron ore reserves in the Pilbara region. In the 1960s, Hammersley Iron was formed to mine the ore. Total high-grade iron ore deposits in the northwest have been estimated at some 24,000 million tonnes, and that doesn't count the numerous deposits of lower-grade iron ore. Mount Tom Price is one of the richest ore bodies in the world. This huge diesel-electric drill bores down 16 metres into the ore body in preparation for blasting. Truckloads of liquefied explosives are pumped into the holes. When all the holes are filled, the whole mine is cleared and work stops until the blast is over. Safety is the prime consideration of the company. We were lucky to be able to film a blast, as they only have one every couple of months. The dense cloud of iron ore dust rises 200 metres into the air. The breeze soon clears the site and the all clear signal is given for work to commence again. Conventional open cut mining methods are used and the terraces caused by the mining are known as mine benches. The benches are blasted to 14 metres depth and the loosened ore is loaded onto the huge Wabco dump trucks by these diesel electric shovels. These giant shovels between them dig about 130,000 tonnes of ore a day.
The shovels can load 120 tonnes of ore into the truck in about four or five bites. There are about 30 trucks in operation at Tom Price and six giant shovels to load them. The immense size of the Wabco dump trucks is only apparent when seen in comparison with a conventional saloon car. All the vehicles and shovels on the mine site are equipped with two-way radio, keeping them in contact with pit control, which controls all movement in the mine. Everyone in the mine area must wear safety glasses and helmets, including visitors. To find out what it's like to drive one of these monsters, we're going to have a talk with Ian Rice. He's been driving this truck now for three years, or one of these trucks. Yeah. Ian, what's it like to drive one of these huge trucks? Oh, really easy. they got no gears, you've just got a forward control and a reverse control, and that's all there is to actually driving them. In that sense, you've got no gears, no clutch. It's just a uh, diesel motor driving electric generator, which in turn operates the two rear motors for the... Uh, drive. Ian, how do you stop such a huge truck with a full load when you're going down these steep hills? Oh, they've got what you call dynamic brakes, which is an electrical current which reverses the flow of the electrical current in the motors and actually is, all of this is a retarder actually, then you come into your air brakes, they're not used to stop you completely, just your air brakes which are all independent on the four wheels. Could I override in it and see what it's like up there? Certainly. Well, well, there you go. go. I'll follow right. you. Sitting in the truck's air-conditioned cabin, we're four metres above the roadway. It feels like a huge boat moving across the ground. Ian Rice says once you get used to the truck's width, the rest is easy. Easier, in fact, than driving a car. Trucks cart the ore from the mine to the primary crushers where the raw material is dumped down a chute into a huge gyratory crusher. Crusher reduces the ore down to approximately 18 centimetre lumps. Conveyor belts deliver the primary crushed ore to stockpiles from where it is further reduced in size by more crushing. These mining, crushing and screening operations are designed to produce a lump ore of consistent size that can be fed directly into a blast furnace for iron making. The ore is stockpiled for loading into the Hammersley trains that take it to the coastal port of Dampier, 300 kilometres away. The bulk of the ore is shipped to Japan. Hammersley Iron has exported over 140 million tonnes of iron ore, earning export revenues of over $1,000 million. This train is loading what is known as fines, which is formed into pellets at Dampier before exporting to iron making countries.
15 minutes drive from the mine site is the township of Tom Price. Fully furnished air conditioned homes are available for workers and their families at six or seven dollars per week. Hammersley Iron has spared no expense in the development of the town site. Sealed roads, sports ovals, schools, theatres, a hospital and a swimming pool are just some of the amenities provided for the town by the company. Now remember, how do you start the struggle? I was put this top in the 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 top even with all these amenities, some men have found time to build boats, which will have to be trucked 300 kilometres to be launched. This 10 metre yacht is one of four boats being built at Tom Price. I spoke to the builder. What makes a man build a boat out here 300 kilometres from the coast? Well, I think it's mainly the uh, challenge of doing uh, something like this. Also, it breaks monotony up here. Uh, you've got a lot of free time to yourself, uh, although there's a lot of sporting activities up here, but you have got this time to yourself, and if you're an active sort of a bloke, uh, good with your hands, it's just a challenge, mainly. It is said there is enough iron ore in the Pilbara area to supply world needs for at least a century, so the future of towns like Tom Price seems assured. <laughs> Ask the Leylands, ask the Leylands, travel all over the countryside. Ask the Leyland brothers. Whatever it is that you want to see, ask the Leylands, ask the Leylands, no matter whatever that happens to be. Ask the Leyland brothers. Come on, me in and then join in the fun. Travel all over Australia. The breeze soon clears the site and the all clear signal is given for work to commence again. Conventional open cut mining methods are used and the terraces caused by the mining are known as mine benches. The benches are blasted to 14 metres depth and the loosened ore is loaded onto the huge Wabco dump trucks by these diesel electric shovels. These giant shovels between them dig about 130,000 tonnes of ore a day. The shovels can load 120 tonnes of ore into the truck in about four or five bites. There are about 30 trucks in operation at Tom Price and six giant shovels to load them. The immense size of the Wabco dump trucks is only apparent when seen in comparison with a conventional saloon car. All the vehicles and shovels on the mine site are equipped with two-way radio, keeping them in contact with pit control, which controls all movement in the mine. Everyone in the mine area must wear safety glasses and helmets, including visitors. To find out what it's like to drive one of these monsters, we're going to have a talk with Ian Rice. He's been driving this 
truck now for three years. Or well, one of these trucks. Yeah. Ian, what's it like to drive one of these huge trucks? Oh, really easy. They got no gears. You just got a forward control and a reverse control, and that's all there is to actually driving them. In that sense, you got no gears, no clutch. It's just a, a diesel motor driving an electric generator, which in turn operates the two rear motors for the uh, drive. Ian, yeah, how do you stop such a huge truck with a full load when you're going down these steep hills? Oh. Load. Yeah, and how do you stop such a huge truck with a full load when you're going down these steep hills? Oh, they've got what you call dynamic brakes, which is an electrical current which reverses the flow of the electrical current in the motors. And actually, is, all of this is a retarder, actually, then you come into your air brakes. They're not used to stop you completely, just your air brakes, which are all independent on the four wheels. Could I have a ride in it and see what it's like up there? Certainly. Well, well, there you go. I'll follow you. Sitting in the truck's air-conditioned cabin, we're four metres above the roadway. It feels like a huge boat moving across the ground. Ian Rice says once you get used to the truck's width, the rest is easy. Easier, in fact, than driving a car. Trucks cart the ore from the mine to the primary crushers where the raw material is dumped down a chute into a huge gyratory crusher. The pressure reduces the ore down to approximately 18 centimetre lumps. Conveyor belts deliver the primary crushed ore to stockpiles from where it is further reduced in size by more crushing. These mining, crushing and screening operations are designed to produce a lump ore of consistent size that can be fed directly into a blast furnace for iron making. The ore is stockpiled for loading into the Hamsley trains that take it to the coastal port of Dampier, 300 kilometres away. The bulk of the ore is shipped to Japan. Hammersley Iron has exported over 140 million tonnes of iron ore, earning export revenues of over $1,000 million. You're not looking at the incredible shrinking man. I'm just standing beside one of the giants of the West. 1,000 horsepower, 84 tonne Wabco iron ore truck. One tyre alone costs $3,000. And they carry 120 tonnes of iron ore from one of the biggest open cut mines in the world. Everything over here in the West is big. And the reason we're here today is that Mr A. McDonald from Parramatta in New South Wales wrote and said, I, like many people, have a dabble on the stock market. And hear names like Hammersley Iron, Mount Tom Price and the like, but I've no idea what these places look like. Could I ask the Leyland brothers to go to the Hammersley area and show me these iron ore mines and the towns that have been built because of them? Well, Mr MacDonald, we're going to show you the whole operation of the Mount Tom Price mine. Iron ore has brought life to the northwest. Lang Hancock, grazier and prospector, was a discoverer of the huge iron ore reserves in the Pilbara region. In the 1960s, Hammersley Iron was formed to mine the ore. 
Total high-grade iron ore deposits in the northwest have been estimated at some 24,000 million tonnes, and that doesn't count the numerous deposits of lower-grade iron ore. Mount Tom Price is one of the richest ore bodies in the world. This huge diesel electric drill bores down 16 metres into the ore body in preparation for blasting. Truckloads of liquefied explosives are pumped into the holes. When all the holes are filled, the whole mine is cleared and work stops until the blast is over. Safety is the prime consideration of the company. We were lucky to be able to film a blast, as they only have one every couple of months. The dense cloud of iron ore dust rises 200 metres into the air. of 200 metres. The area is now a national park and taking sand or damaging formations is prohibited. The variety of colours and tones seems to be endless, from delicate pastels to strong rich reds and oranges, with every shade between. Everywhere one looks are intriguing natural sculptures. Uh, could we tell John Cunningham how the colours got here in the sand? Yeah Mike, there's two basic things here that uh sort of forms the colour. Firstly is decaying vegetation and secondly is all the iron through the range. Now originally they say that there was a tremendous amount of iron in this range here but gradually over a period of time it's rusted away and the decaying vegetation sets up a sort of a dye in it and then the rusting of the iron also adds its colouring to the sand itself. And you can see this vein of iron running through here but with the salt air that iron layer by layer it'll rust back to a dust and of course in the process it stains the sand. Well John, to answer your question about is the coloured sand used for anything today, we found an artist, Bern Kemp, who uses the coloured sands to make sand paintings. Now Bern, where did you get the sand? Well actually they came from the coloured sands before it became a national park. Uh, and, and you do get sand from elsewhere as well? Oh yes, from right along the coastline. And all the colours in the sands here, are they natural? Yes, Mike, they're natural. There's no, no, no artificial colours or pigments. Before he can use the sand, Byrne sorts it into different tonings. He has counted 70 different colours. Byrne's technique of preparing the sand for painting is a result of years of experimentation and is a closely guarded secret. Once prepared, the sand is applied with pallet knives and brushes. All Byrne's works are sand alone. He uses no artificial colouring. Many of Byrne's paintings reflect his interest in local history. One of his favourites is the Aboriginal legend of the coloured sands. The beautiful maiden Marawa was in love with the rainbow. One day she escaped from Burwell, the man who had enslaved her. As she ran along the beach, he sent his terrible boomerang to kill her. The faithful rainbow sped to rescue Marawa. The boomerang and rainbow met in the sky with a terrible roar. The boomerang died instantly, and the poor shattered rainbow lay on the beach to die. It is still there, with all its colours forming the hills along the beach. Or as legend would have us believe. History, on the other hand, is in no risk of contradiction about the shipwreck of the Cherry Venture. It is held firmly by the beach of coloured sands. These unique paintings have found their way into private collections all over the world. The variety of colours and tones seems to be endless, from delicate pastels to strong rich reds and oranges, with every shade between. Everywhere one looks are intriguing natural sculptures. Uh, could we tell John Cunningham how the colours got here in the sand? Yeah, Mike, there's two basic things here that uh, sort of forms the colour. Firstly is decaying vegetation, 
and secondly is all the iron through the range. Now originally they say that there was a tremendous amount of iron in this range here, but gradually over a period of time it's rusted away and the decaying vegetation sets up a sort of a dye in it and then the rusting of the iron also adds its colouring to the sand itself. And you can see this vein of iron running through here. Well with the salt air, that iron layer by layer it'll rust back to a dust and of course in the process it stains the sand. Well John, to answer your question about is the coloured sand used for anything today, we found an artist, Bern Kemp, who uses the coloured sands to make sand paintings. Now Bern, where did you get the sand? Well actually they came from the coloured sands before it became a national park. Uh, and, and you do get sand from elsewhere as well? Oh yes, from right along the coastline. And all the colours in the sands here, are they natural? Yes Mike, they're natural. There's no, no, no artificial colours or pigments. Before he can use the sand, Byrne sorts it into different tonings. He has counted 70 different colours. Byrne's technique of preparing the sand for painting is a result of years of experimentation and is a closely guarded secret. Once prepared, the sand is applied with palette knives and brushes. All Byrne's works are sand alone. He uses no artificial colouring. Many of Byrne's paintings reflect his interest in local history. One of his favourites is the Aboriginal legend of the coloured sands. The beautiful maiden Marawa was in love with the rainbow. One day she escaped from Burwell, the man who had enslaved her. As she ran along the beach, he sent his terrible boomerang to kill her. The faithful rainbow sped to rescue Marawa. The boomerang and rainbow met in the sky with a terrible roar. The boomerang died instantly, and the poor shattered rainbow lay on the beach to die. It is still there, with all its colours forming the hills along the beach. Or as legend would have us believe, History, on the other hand, is in no risk of contradiction about the shipwreck of the Cherry Venture. It is held firmly by the beach of coloured sands. These unique paintings have found their way into private collections all over the world. Is it the subtle natural colours that add so much to Burns' paintings? Or is it Burns'